Good evening, everyone. It's a joy to welcome you to another one of our midweek Bible studies. We continue our current series through First and Second Kings this evening. And if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open those to First Kings chapter 15. Our focal lesson for this evening is found in verses 9 through 22. I want to backtrack a little bit, as I typically do, to set the scene for what we're about to look at. Uh, following Rehoboam's flight back to Jerusalem, and of course he wasn't in a 727, but fleeing in his chariot to escape those who had killed Adoram, his emissary as we talked about last week, Jeroboam was named king of Israel, as had been prophesied in 1 Kings 12, 20. And we spoke somewhat of Jeroboam's lack of faithfulness to God last week, noting that he had ordered two golden calves to be built at both Dan and at Bethel so that the Israelites there under his rule wouldn't have to travel to Jerusalem to worship in the temple where Rehoboam was ro ruling over the one remaining tribe of Judah that was under the southern uh, kingdom at that time. We also noted in 1 Kings 13, verses 33 through 34, the summary of the evil that Jeroboam had done, ordaining priests for those who led in the worship of the pagan gods as at the high places. There was more or less a constant state of warfare that existed between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And we read about that in 1 Kings 14.30 and 1 Kings 15.6 uh, during the lifetime of these two kings. Uh, Rehoboam also misled Judah, as we read in 1 Kings 14, 21 through 31. Speaking of Judah's misconduct under the king, uh, there's a summary statement in verses 23 and 24 of that 14th chapter that reads like this. For they also built for themselves high places and sacred places and ashram on every high hill and beneath every luxuriant tree. There were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Rehoboam uh, died after ruling for 41 years and his son Abijam uh, became king in his place, but he only ruled for three years. Uh, and we read in 1 Kings 15, 3, that he walked in the ways of his father and wasn't wholeheartedly devoted to God. Well, we come to our focal lesson today, and in verses 8 through 9, we read that Ab Abijam was succeeded by one of the rare good kings, Asa, who came to power during the 20th year of Jeroboam's rule in Israel in the north. We learn in verse 10 that his was also a lengthy rule of 41 years, and that gave time for the positive reforms that he introduced to take root and flourish. And after the spiritually bankrupt reigns of Rehoboam and Abijam, on top of the final years as well of Solomon's rule when he failed to lead God's people well, Judah was desperate for someone who could provide some solid spiritual leadership to the nation. And we read in verse 10 that his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom. Interestingly enough, that's the identical description that is found in verse 2 of Asa's father, Abijah. Uh, and obviously, we've got something going on here. And the Hebrew word can be translated, that is translated here as mother, can also be translated as grandmother. And, and that's what is required in that understanding with 1 Kings 15 too. Uh, we're introduced to the quality of his leadership as king in verse 11, where we read, Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord like David, his father. Technically, of course, David would have been Asa's great-great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, that's another illustration of a little bit of the imprecision at times of the Hebrew language. And, but invoking the reign of his ancestor David connects Asa with the positive legacy of Israel's most renowned and famous king. David had certainly done his part to try and instill in Solomon the importance of walking in obedience to God's commandments. And As we saw, Solomon started well, but he didn't end that way. He ended quite poorly. And it doesn't seem, on the other hand, that Solomon took any pains to try and instruct Rehoboam in the ways of the Lord, given that by that time he himself was pursuing the gods of his many foreign wives. Asa, on the other hand, recognized the need to call the people of God back to the worship of the one true God. And that in turn in, involved doing away with their pagan practices. The first step that he took in that direction, we read about in verse 12, was to put away or banish from the land the male cultic prostitutes that were involved in, in leading in worship. The Canaanites frequently uh, incorporated sexual rites into their worship as their gods of Baal and Asherah were linked to fertility rites. God had specifically warned his people through Moses against these practices even before they arrived in the land in Jeremiah 20, I'm sorry, in Deuteronomy 23, 17, that reads like this. None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute, nor shall any of the sons of Israel's be a cult prostitute. 
And Asa was doing his part here to call the people of Judah back to God by banishing those who led in immoral sexual practices as a part of the pagan worship. Verse 12 goes on to describe the second measure that he took in this spiritual reform effort, removing all of the idols which his fathers had made. And we've seen in recent weeks how both Solomon and Rehoboam had each erected places of worship to the pagan gods of their neighboring peoples. Asa was really, in effect, going back to the very first of the Ten Commandments that God had given to his people at Mount Sinai, where he told them that they were to have no other gods before him, nor to make for themselves idols or graven images as objects of worship. Because if the people were to return to God, Asa recognized a major step to facilitate this would be removing those idols as a temptation for them to worship instead of following the one true God. The next step in his spiritual reform program was to remove his own grandmother, Maka, from being the queen mother. And he did so based on her having made an obscene or a horrid image of Asherah as an object of pagan worship. Now we've noted repeatedly the tendency of the Israelites to pursue the false gods of Baal and Asherah, the latter of which Asherah was symbolized by poles that were placed in high places. The word translated here as obscene horrid, detestable, abominable, or filthy, comes from a root word that means to shudder. Uh, that word suggests a, a strong visible bodily reaction in the presence of evil. But Asa not only removed her from her office, but he also chopped down her pagan image, this Asherah pole, and had it burned in the Kidron Valley, which lies to the east of Jerusalem that one would cross on the way to the Mount of Olives. It's likely that the destruction of this Asherah was Asherah pole was done publicly by Asa as an object lesson for the people of Israel to point out their need to abandon the worship of pagan gods and return to the worship of the one true God. The one negative strike against Asa, Asa is mentioned in verse 14. There we read that the high places were not taken away. Now we've encountered repeated emphasis and references to these elevated places where the pagan gods and goddesses were worshipped by their prophets and by the Israelites as well. God had warned the people specifically even before they arrived in the promised land against this practice. We read, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 2 to 5, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and burn their ashram with fire. And you shall cut down the engraved images of their gods and obliterate their name from that place. You shall not act like this toward the Lord your God but you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling. And there you shall come. And we know that when they arrived there, God ordained that the temple would be in Jerusalem. And this is where the people were to come to worship and offer sacrifices rather than on these high places of their pagan uh, gods and goddesses. Well, even with that disclaimer about not doing away with the high places, we read in the latter half of verse 14 that Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. He wasn't a flash in the pan who faded quickly, nor someone like Solomon who, whose devotion to God waned as he aged and, and grew older. As we noted, he had a long reign of 41 years, so for four plus decades, he led the people of God to the best of his ability to turn back to the Lord and provided them a strong example to follow. Verse 15 informs us that as an additional measure, Asa also brought dedicated or consecrated gifts of his father, and presumably here we're talking about Solomon, not Rehoboam, as well as gifts of his own to the temple. Those are described as silver and gold and utensils, which were then dedicated for use in the worship of the Lord at the temple. And we see in all of these steps of reform that Asa introduced a commitment to serve God wholeheartedly, even if it meant prioritizing his relationship to the Lord above that of his own family. We noted in two previous verses the ongoing war that existed between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And now we read in verse 16 of our text that a state of war also continued between Asa and Baasha, the king of Israel. Now, Baasha was the grandson of Jeroboam. And the mention of these reigns of the kings is a bit disjointed in these chapters because we read at the conclusion of Jeroboam's reign as, as his death is recorded in 1 Kings 14, 20. But uh, he reigned for 22 years and at that point was succeeded by his son Nadab. Verse 1 of chapter 15, on the other hand, rewinds the history of a little bit as it reports Abijam becoming king of Judah during the 18th year of Jeroboam's reign. 
uh, his death has already been mentioned, but again, he's rewinding this to put in the context of the kings now of Judah. And we discover in 1 Kings 15, 25, that Nadab, who was Jeroboam's son, assumed the throne of Israel during the second year of Asa's reign. He also did evil, as his father had done, and his reign lasted just one year before he was killed by Basha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar. Now, this is not the same Ahijah who prophesied to Jeroboam that the kingdom was going to be stripped away from Solomon and given uh, ten tribes of them given to him. Uh, and because he, this Ahijah the prophet, is identified as Ahijah the Shilonite, whereas this Ahijah that we're talking about now, the son of uh, or the father of Basha uh, was from the house of Issachar. There's also a bit of discrepancy between the accounts found in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles as to the nature of this ongoing war between Asa and Basha. 1 Kings 15, 16, and 15, 32 basically portray it as a non-stop state of war, just continual fighting. On the other hand, 2 Chronicles 14, 1 says that the land was undisturbed for the first 10 years of Asa's reign. And in addition, on the heels of the description of these spiritual reform movements that we've just talked about, 2 Chronicles 15, 19 says that there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. So uh, either there was continual war or, or uh, the writer of 2 Chronicles is a little bit more accurate and takes into account some periods of peace that took place. Well, the time of the resumption of the war that was mentioned in the 35th year of Asa's reign uh, coincides with verse 17 of our text today when Basha initiated a war by building up Ramah. This was an important city in the land of the tribe of Benjamin. It was mere five miles north of Jerusalem, so very close proximity. And Basha's strategy is made clear in the same verse that indicates he intended to fortify this city so that no one could leave Judah and travel north through it to the major trade routes that ran both north and south and east and west through that region. And this, of course, would have restricted Asa's access to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea for any seagoing fare, and also to the northwest and to the northeast as well, to the Jordan River Valley to be able to cross there and engage in trade to the east of there. Asa realized, of course, that he would be cut off from vital trade if he allowed Basha's blockade to be established there in Ramah. So he concocts a plan that involves liquidating all the remaining silver and gold in both the temple treasury as well as in that of the royal palace. And he entrusts those riches to some servants whom he sends to Ben-Hadad, who is the king of Aram, or Syria, who lived in Damascus at the time. Now, we typically think of Apostle, the Apostle Paul when we hear the word Damascus because that was his, his destination, his announced destination when he was going there to imprison additional Christians when the Lord appeared to him on the road and his miraculous conversion uh, six, uh, happened there. He also, of course, was baptized there by Ananias and later forced to flee the city uh, under cover of darkness when his preaching upset the Jewish authorities there. Well, the me, the message that Asa sends with, with this uh, offering of gold and silver via his servants is to propose a treaty or a covenant between these two kings. His message references an earlier treaty that existed between their two fathers. Now, we don't encounter any mention of such a treaty in the Bible, so uh, he might refer to earlier ancestors, again, using the word father in a loose, looser sense than the, the actual uh, parents of the two kings. Or it could be simply that this treaty wasn't commented upon by the other biblical writers. Asa's message to Ben-Hadad uh, calls attention to this gift or present of silver and gold that he has sent with the request to enter into the treaty together. And the Lifeway Teachers Quarterly notes that the same word is translated elsewhere as a bribe in Proverbs 17, 23 and Micah 3, 11. And it's clear that that is the purpose of the gold and silver that he's offering the rival king. He requests a specific action by Ben-Hadad in exchange for this gift, that he break the treaty that he has established with Basha with Basha, so that the threat of an attack from the north by Ben-Hadad's forces will force Basha to withdraw his troops and his forces from, from Ramah and allow Asa to be able to travel freely to the north. It's certainly worth noting here that Asa is engaged in something that God consistently had warned his people not to do elsewhere in the Old Testament. Instead of looking to the Lord for deliverance and protection, Asa takes it upon himself to scheme and develop a plan by which uh, to ensure freedom of travel to the north. 
Doing so, it though, involves violating God's frequent counsel to the kings and the leaders of his people not to look to foreign powers or enter into alliances with them in order to uh, obtain deliverance from their troubles. God is more than capable of rescuing them if they will look to him for deliverance rather than turning to a foreign uh, military might. Well, the proposal of Asa to Ben-Hadad was agreeable to him, as we read in verse 20. The writer there simply tells us that Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa. And then he proceeded to send the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel in the northern region. Three specific cities are named, as well as two broader geographic designations. And when I read about this multi-front attack on the north, I can't help but think of the concerted effort in recent days by Russia to take Ukraine on multiple forces and in multiple fronts. His forces attacked Ejon, a city on the northern frontier of Israel, as well as Dan, some seven miles to the southeast of Ejon. This is, of course, where Jeroboam had placed one of the two golden calves to be worshipped. Next, the city of Abel Beth Maka, which was about five miles northwest of Dan and south of Ejon, is also mentioned. And then there's the two broader references to geographic regions. First of all, Chinneroth or Chinnereth, which would indicate the area around the Sea of Galilee. There was a city by that name on its northwestern shore, and the modern Hebrew name for that lake is Kinneret, which means zither, a stringed instrument that basically has the same shape as the lake itself. There's also a reference to all the land of Naphtali, again, one of the tribes, but a broader description of the land to the north of, south, uh, north of the Sea of Galilee and southward down around it as well. Well, with all of these regions being attacked by Ben-Hadad's armies, Basha knew that his northern borders were at risk of being overrun and captured. So Asa's bribe did the trick, as we discover in verse 21. When word of these attacks against the northern cities reaches Basha, he ceases construction to fortify the city of Ramah. And we further read that he remained in Tirzah, which was a city located in Manasseh's tribal territory, which served as one of the capital cities of the northern kingdom of Israel until Omri, one of the later kings, moved the capital to Samaria. As is reported in 1 Kings 16, 23 to 24. Well, the construction ended, but Asa next takes some steps to dismantle the fortifications that had been built in Ramah to prevent them from being used in the future against him. Verse 22 tells us that he issued a universal proclamation to all of Judah. No one was exempt from it. That everyone had to go to Ramah and carry away from it the stones and the timber that Basha had used there to fortify the city. Uh, these, in turn, the, the stones and the timber, were transported to the towns of Geba and Mizpah to strengthen their defenses. Geba lay to the north of Ramah and was part of the territory of Benjamin, one of the 48 cities also that was designated for the Levites to inhabit. Mizpah, on the other hand, lay just north of Geba and was where the Israelites had crowned Saul as their king that we read about in 1 Samuel 10, 17-25. The action of strength in these two cities uh, added additional defense against any future military overtures by Basha or his successors uh, going forward. In the final analysis, we'd have to say that Asa did many things right as he moved the people back towards serving the Lord with the religious form, reforms that he had introduced. Banishing these male cult prostitutes and removing the idols of so many of the pagan gods that the Israelites had begun to worship were certainly positive steps in the right direction. Being willing to even confront his own grandmother and her pagan idolatry speaks of his commitment to seeking the Lord ahead of his own family. The negative strike against him, as we noted, was his failure to wholly trust God to deliver him from the attacks of Basha and resorting to bribing a foreign king to form a military alliance rather than seeking God's face to rescue him and his people. Well, I want to thank you for joining in this evening for this Bible study and look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. And I invite you to pray with me as we wrap up our study this evening. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Asa, how you used him to call your people back to following you to eliminate so many of the pagan practices that had been introduced. We recognize at the same time, even with the description of wholehearted devotion to you, that, that he erred in some areas of, of refusing or failing to remove the high places and also of, of entering into this military alliance rather than trusting in you. Lord, we know that this 
simply points out that in our fallen sinful nature, all of us, even as we strive to serve you, will fall, we will err, we'll sin against you. And when we do that, Lord, I pray that we might have the, the courage and the humility to own our, our shortcomings, to recognize, confess those with the beautiful promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to walk in your ways this week is my prayer in Jesus' name. God bless you. Hope to see you, that is, this coming Sunday. God bless you. Bye now.